So good morning to everyone. I know that we're going to have a few more people uh, coming in in the next few minutes. Uh, I'm going to once again share the slides uh, for today's presentation. Thank you for being here. I am Ruth Davis, coordinator for the Evergreen Indiana Consortium. We are going to go through a lot of things in an hour. Uh, there are several links and links to further training, and there will be a further training. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that at least if you have not yet seen uh, some of these things, that you at least have some context to go back through them. The other thing before we move on is that I do want to also give a shout out to our training cohort. Um, and I'm going to try to run through the names just so that you have this in your mind and it's on the recording. If I do for some reason forget somebody, make me feel bad about it later, for sure. Uh, so we have Amanda Knoll from Lowell Public Library, um, Vicki, from South Whitley Community Public Library, Ashley Fletcher from West Lafayette Public Library, Sarah Perry from Westfield Public Library, Sarah Morey from Morrison Reeves Public Library, Anita Brown from Kendallville, and I know that I am forgetting somebody there, but they have been working since January on uh, learning more about the Aspen system, uh, working on behalf of their libraries, but then also to become resource people within Evergreen, Indiana, uh, as we begin having more of these collegial conversations through the listserv and more. So thank you to all of them. We're going to look at some of their Aspen sites in just a moment. Thank you to Britta for also putting the slides into chat. Uh, and let's get started. Okay, I'm gonna just briefly go through uh, some of the things that I already did for the kickoff for Aspen Discovery, basically reminding you what the point is of it. Uh, Aspen Discovery is a new user experience for all of our member libraries. I know that some libraries are going to use it more extensively than others. Um, this is a good time to point out that the traditional catalog, the traditional search um, or OPEC, however you want to refer to it, is not going away at all. And you are going to find that there are patrons who, who prefer that just because they've gotten used to it. Um, so you're going to have the ability to use both of them in your interactions and the way that you uh, promote your library and your library collections and, and all of the things that go along with that. I'm not going to read through everything here other than to say Aspen has a lot of tools that you can use or not use. Uh, it really is up to you because what it does provide, finally, I guess, I, I'm going to use that word because I, because I can, finally provides you with a search experience and a catalog experience and a user experience for your patrons that can be customized to your local library. With all of the benefits of having the shared databases in Evergreen and the, the resources and all of that, but still looking like your library, feeling like your library and all of that. It also provides a lot of possibilities um, in terms of additional resources and um, a way to kind of simplify your web presence. And then there is almost, I don't want to say there's too much, I don't believe there's ever too much documentation, but I, I do feel like at the end of this and every single slide, I want to say, but wait, there's more. Uh, there is a lot uh, of training, um, and hopefully more. And I will tell you one of the things I am hoping will happen um, in the consortium is that you all, as people who are going to be administering Aspen on behalf of your libraries for your patrons, 
that there's something you get really excited about and something you want to show somebody else how to do. Maybe these become conference presentations. Maybe these become documents, whatever. Uh, I'm hopeful and I believe that that's going to happen because this is such an exciting tool. Again, I'm not going to read through this. These are some great points that when you're talking about Aspen, uh, to your library board, maybe your friends group, maybe stakeholders within your community, uh, that you can take some of these bullet points and explain why and what. So there's some, some copy for you. Okay, I like to start with what this looks like. And I know that people have been uh, going to other libraries' websites and, and checking these out. I do have listed here um, our training cohort um, sites, and I am going to use them as some examples for some specific things. And then our general catalog. I do want to make a point, and I'm going to go back to that real quickly. Oh, okay, it's not going to let me link there. That's full. Oh, I think I know why. Never mind. Uh, so, but I have it up here, so it's okay. So, one of the things I want to point out about the Evergreen Indiana General Catalog is that you all have been very used to just using the same catalog as everyone else with some, maybe some dialed in ways. Maybe you have the org unit up in the URL for your link so that it goes to search your library. First, those types of things. That has changed. So now in the general catalog, there are some notable things missing. Uh, there are no e-resources in here because the consortium doesn't have access to e-resources and I'm speaking specifically about Libby and Hoopla, uh, members of the consortium have access to those things. So I can click on this and you will see that I don't have any eBooks showing up. If I were to go to another library, and I'm just gonna go to Adams County because it's the first one that comes to mind and I click on something that is in what's called the same, this is a browse category. These are the same browse categories, which we'll talk, talk about. If I click on a title there, I'm going to see more things um, available there, including e-resources, because they are a member of the Indiana Digital Library and do have those types of resources. So those are not going to show up here any longer. Uh, and this is going to be a much more general search. The other thing that I do want to point out is that this general catalog is not the same as the Indiana State Library's catalog. They also have their own um, catalog and its state library. And it also does not include ebooks because they're also not a member. But this will give the state library an opportunity to also highlight their collections separate from uh, the general consortium. I'm gonna see, there we go. I need to click on just the right spot. So before we go into the basics of admin, I just want to uh, point out a few things that we're gonna talk about more. We're gonna be talking about browse categories. This is Kendallville Public Library. You notice that they also put a uh, system message here, actually two system messages, uh, that I will not be covering today, but we'll send out information after uh, this webinar on how to add those to your website. It's pretty easy, um, but it's a lot easier if somebody shows you where to go. So one of the things that I want to first point out is that uh, Kendallville has been actively working on their browse categories and they have made public one of them so far, which is a local writing, um, I believe it's a contest that they do on an annual basis. And then they catalog those uh, things that are part of that for this uh, 
I'm going to say Kleeman, could be Kleiman, creative writers. And one of the things I also want to point out here that Aspen does, we've talked a lot in Evergreen about cover art in the catalog. Aspen gives you some alternatives. It will either generate cover art for items that don't have it, or it gives you the option to upload a default image or something else that we'll talk about later on after this um, this training. So that's Kendallville, just very briefly. I also want to um, point out something that Lowell has done, and we're going to talk about this as well. You can see that their menu bar looks a little bit dif different than um, Pendleville in that they have added um, a link to their wireless printing information. They've also done some things with browse categories. Uh, and this was an inter interesting conversation because this actually, uh, we were first talking about this because Vernon Township, which I'll show you there's very quickly, had put in a browse category for gardening. And we talked about how we can um, be inspired by browse categories at other libraries. Hopefully we will get into that. I'm gonna leave Vernon Township open for a moment because there's something there that I wanna show you in a moment. Um, and then I'm gonna save West Lafayette and some of the others uh, for later. did want to show you Morrison Reeves. Morrison Reeves is not yet a live member of Evergreen Indiana. They'll be going live on April the 30th, but they are working diligently on both migrating their data into our database, um, also an index website that will be announced in more detail to the rest of the consortium as well as their Aspen interface. And so they have been customizing it as much as they can already. It is important to note that these are showing things in the consortium. None of these things actually are on Morrison Reeves shelves in Evergreen right now because none of their data is there. So you can see it all available online, available from another library. They are a member of the Indiana Digital Library. So if they had patrons loaded, they could check things out here, but they don't yet. All right, so let's get into some basics. Some of these you have already done, um, or some of you have already done them and some of you have not. I should have put here, I actually have some other steps that are at the end. The first first steps is that uh, somebody needs to be identified within their library as becoming or wanting to become a local Aspen administrator. So they're identified. There's a form that's linked at the end of this presentation for that. Then they have to log in and then they have to verify that they've logged in because before any permissions can be added to their account, they have to actually log in and be then in the Aspen system. They're logging in just using their Evergreen staff account. After that, then there are some things to update for your library. I have a few of them listed here. Um, there are some additional ones that are uh, talked about in the some further trainings that we'll talk about later on here. But I have here uh, some things in bold and some things that are not bolded. And um, I'm going to go into, well, I'm going to keep that up because something I want to show you. So I'm going to actually log into the general and it's, I've already logged in. But if I hadn't, it would say sign in and I just click on that and it, it would pop up a thing or I could go to my account and it would do that, but I'm gonna go here to Aspen Administration. If you see something, okay, I'm gonna have to close it, otherwise I'll keep clicking on it. If you see something here in bold, you can, um, well, not click on the slide, that's not a great idea, but from your PDF, 
you can uh, click on that or select that. And that's going to be something that you can search for in here. So you can see that I have primary configuration. I'm going to just put in primary configuration, not there. My apologies right here. Search for a setting. And that's going to uh, get me here. Now, um, from there, I'm just going to click on locations. I think I could actually search for locations. I think that that would actually do it as well. Uh, and then um, I can put in short code. And in this case, maybe I'm looking for atoms. And this is going to be where you're going to update the hours for your library. You don't have to type anything in. You could just click on things to make it through here. Click and scroll or scroll and click. Um, but let me go back real quickly to the administration home. If you don't kind of hone in a little bit, then you get to scroll through a lot of settings. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Works perfectly fine. I have done it way too many times. Um, but it gets you the same place. It can be easier, especially if you're doing a lot of things uh, to just kind of search for settings. And you can have it either here or you can go to administration home and search for a setting there. So you're going to want to update the hours for each of your locations if you have multiple locations. And then you're going to want to put in closed dates. This is one of those things. I was a little bit surprised about this. I thought that it would just take the information from Evergreen and populate it into Aspen. Uh, for whatever reason, it does not. I think they're probably stored in different places in different ways. So, so those are things that do need to be set up. They're used differently as well. Of course, these are not affecting um, circulations per se, but they are affecting holds, that's information that gets sent back to the system. So make sure that those are updated. Uh, also, there are there's contact information um, in there as well. And um, contact information and there, there's another, oh, address for your library as well. So that's just some housekeeping things to do. Uh, when you are, when you verify that you have been able to log in, that information is also included in the email. N not necessarily where to go, but there is a link on how to do, uh, update those hours and the holidays. Does close dates here include dates that pop up like um, eclipse day or snow day? Uh, not necessarily. No, you don't have to do emergency processing in the same way that you do in Evergreen. So you you could put it in as a closed day if it's something you knew about. Uh, or, and it, it may in some way impact things like placards, how long uh, they show if there's like a time duration as opposed to an end date. Or, or those types of things, but it is, it is not necessary to put in emergency close dates in Aspen. Great question, thank you. Okay, so there are two things that really come to mind for me when I'm thinking, well, two immediate things that come to mind. Uh, when I am thinking about Aspen, they are menus and they are themes that have to do with navigation and and then how pretty it is. I, I love a pretty website. That is me. I'm, not everybody has the same priorities at all. But these were the, the first things that I ever noticed about this or any discovery layer is that it looks good and it makes me want to explore more. Uh, there are things to keep in mind when we are using this in the same way that if we're designing a website, we should be keeping these things in mind as well. They are usability, accessibility, and style. Usability is, I have this website, does it do what I want it to do? It, does it lead me to find the things that I want? Does it make sense? 
And really, these should be thoughtfully designed. Oftentimes, when we're talking about web design, we use things like wireframe and other planning tools to really map out how we want um, it to work and where we want this page to go and where we want that link to go and all of those things, what we want it to do. I know that oftentimes, and I have experienced this my own self as well, websites tend to grow up organically. Um, and also there is uh, this fear that we miss something. Like we have all these things we need to show everybody everything. Um, but sometimes the planning on how we make that um, visible, discoverable, is not given the same level of um, importance as the actual resources and really needs to be because if you can't find the resource, then it becomes in the same way. If you can't find the book on the shelf, it becomes invisible. It, it's not really there for use if you can't find it to use it. So where you are going to be setting up your menus is going to be under primary configuration and then menu links. So I'm just gonna put in primary configuration, library systems. From there, I'm going to just put in the subdomain here. And that's gonna be different for each of your library. For your library, Karen, it's gonna be Danville. Karen Milliken, it's gonna be Danville. Uh, so you'll put that in and you'll know that um, where to go. And then from here, you can again, scroll if you wanna, or you can kind of dial it in a little bit. And so this is where you're going to um, update your menu. Now you have two menus, essentially. You have this top nav, it says top menu. And then you also have what we refer to as the hamburger. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the best way to do it, but that's the way we started out hearing it. That's the way it's used oftentimes in other web applications, so we're calling it the hamburger. If you do not have this selected to show up in the top menu, it by default shows up in the hamburger menu, just FYI. So I'm gonna scroll down here and I have this link for the classic catalog. Now for this interface, this is showing in the hamburger menu. Your library may decide you want to have this link show up in the top navigation bar. And then you just click here. And then if you want the icon associated with it to show up there as well, you would click this. And it's going to be removed from the hamburger menu and moved into the top navigation menu. Now, there are a couple things that I want to show you here. Let me scroll up real quickly and I'm just going to click on this. So I have this header and then I have um, additional things that are showing up below it. So this is using uh, a category as this and then it is using that same category to define how these links show up. If I just wanted to say have a category just a header up here that linked directly out to um, a page. I could just say, here's the category. This is font awesome is gonna be the, the link, or the name of the font. And I'm gonna click on that real quick. You can select any number of those icons there to show up in different places. Those, those are free, just put the name in here and it shows up. Well, not magically, but it kind of feels a little bit magically. And then you would put in the, the link text. So that's going to be the actual label um, if needs be, and then the URL. And then if you never had anything else to go below it, that was going to be your link. 
I tend to like menus and links in them. Again, this is all about how you want to set this up for your library. I do want to say something very quickly about these icons. Um, I found them really busy uh, initially, and I still find them a little bit busy to have up there, but they do serve an important function in that this catalog is responsive. And I'm going to see if I can like allow you to see this. Let me know if you can see this or not in just a second. I'm making this smaller. Do, so when I click on that, do you see it get smaller on your screen? And you'll notice that what happens is that as it does, um, it has done something with the logo. So it's moved it over. It has also done something with this uh, background image, um, which is just kind of edited it a little bit, uh, cropped it a little bit. But the thing that I want to point out here is that all that text there has disappeared. Um, and it just shows the icons for um, for display. If you don't have the icons there and uh, you're viewing this on a phone or a tablet or something like that, what's going to happen is that there's going to be nothing that shows up there. Those menus are still going to be there, but there's going to be nothing that actually uh, shows where they are. So just kind of like randomly click to find the menu, hopefully. So those icons do serve an important function um, in terms of responsiveness for your library. And then you have some other decisions that you can make as well. Do you want this to open in a new tab? I, see, I made a, the decision here. I didn't want the advanced search to open in a new tab. I wanted it to just stay on the same page and like just act like it was in the same place. But almost everything else um, I do have linking out. Now, there is something that I have learned about this, and you can take it for whatever you want, that linking out to a new tab is not considered accessible behavior because it doesn't always allow somebody um, with certain... Um, challenges to how they are interacting with the website to know that they're linking out. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. You can see I still have it that way. Um, and it, a lot of it just has to do with old browser behavior. Old. This is a modern browser, but it's still behaving like it's old in terms of accessibility. So you have choices about what you include in your menus. This can be things within Aspen, can be things with outside of Aspen, really whatever you want to include there. Then we have accessibility, and I mentioned that a little bit. Um, so we're going to take a look at the themes initially. So you're going to, and I'm going to, I'm just going to go back to the start point. You don't always have to do this, but I'm just going to put in themes click on it. And from here, you're going to search for your library. You can search in the display name or you can search um, in the theme name. Most of these are the same as your short name. I think I messed up a couple. Uh, but so if you feel most comfortable uh, doing this, you can do using the display name, you can do click, just start typing and it will do that and then click on the theme. Um, this is very helpful when you are looking at your colors, which the colors I think are one of the most exciting things in terms of how this displays because you can use them to match things, which, you know, I'm, I just think it's pretty. But it does then provide you with these contrast ratios. And you'll see, and I'm just, I'm not going to actually do this. If I were to put in here, I'm not going to save this. So plain field, you see that there's no contrast there and it turns red. And if these get close, then uh, it turns yellow so that you can kind of keep in mind um, that those should be 
green as often as possible. So there, there are several that are open here. This is also where you're going to um, put your logo. If you want to add a specific favicon up here, I did not change these for libraries with a couple exceptions, but you can. Um, this is also where, uh, and I'll show you this in the, um, well, let me just go to our theme, actually, let me go back. Oh, I do not want to save that terrible change at all. So I'm going to go down here. And so I talked to you just a little bit, showed you what those default uh, covers were on Kendallville's site. For the general catalog, I was like, well, let's test this. And you can actually put in a default cover uh, that will show up as opposed to that generated uh, random cover. It's really your decision, which, which you prefer. I think that there's a case to be made for both of them. And I stole this idea blatantly from Evansville uh, Vanderburg Public Library where they're using a uh, background image and then they superimposed their logo on top of it. Uh, their logo is dramatically different as is their background image, but check out their catalog. And if you search for some things, kind of have to do a little bit of a deep cut because they're very good about having um, cover images that relate to the item, um, but you will see that they have some and it's their cute little uh, webinar. I'm sorry, I just read that out of chat. It's their cute little logo um, over a, a background image. So you can play around with that as well. So another thing that I do want to point out in terms of this theme is that I am using for this catalog a background image. And you can see that here. And as well as a logo, which you can't see because it's white uh, right here. And I want to show you the difference. I'm gonna bring back Vernon Township and this is what I wanted to show you. So for Vernon Township, and I'm gonna sign in here as well. We're gonna get into their theme. So there on the next page. So if you get no result and you have a name that is further along in the alphabet, it's probably on the second page. Are the Aspen tree logos in there currently by default or accessible to us? Uh, when you say uh, the tree logos, do you mean the favicon or are you talking about up here in the browser tab? So all of your libraries currently have um, as close to what I could find as um, a logo for your own libraries. Um, in there, for the Aspen Tree logo, I'm sorry, I don't know what the Aspen Tree logo is. Uh, for the default book cover, that is not for all the libraries. That is only for the general catalog. If you want it, I can send it to you or, or I can actually um, have that added to yours, but it is not default. The default book cover in your catalog is the um, auto-generated. The background picture is also not default for all of the catalogs. Uh, there is no default background picture for any of your catalogs unless somebody in your library has added that. And a good example of this would actually be uh, West Lafayette. You can see that they have their logo, but no background image. No, there is no default for any of those images any longer except for the favicon 
it is all going to be for uh, your specific library. So if I want to go to, oh, if I can stop it. So you can see that we have the logo here for Waterloo Grant uh, Township and then no background image. Um, so I do want to, let me show you the difference here real quickly between having a separate logo from the background image. So Vernon Township, uh, this is their logo and you can see that reflected here. Uh, they do not have a background image and I'm gonna, that's actually down here, header background image which is where that would be. And so if I, and I'm gonna do this again. So you can see that when I scale this down, it scales everything down um, for that image. As opposed to when I do that for the catalog site and where it has a separate background image, from the logo, and then it's able to treat them both a little bit differently. That's a choice. There's not a right or wrong at all for that. Um, let me think if there's anything here that I else that I want to go through. Okay, so definitely keep in mind the contrast ratio, um, and then there's some more information about. Um, accessibility. And then I'm not sure why I put this link here. So I'm going to just move on right here. We'll talk about, well, okay, I will open it and then we'll get back to it. And then style. Style is fun. Uh, and I took the opportunity when we were putting uh, the default sites together or the, the local sites together with their initial defaults, which are changeable by you, um, to because I was just so tickled by their logo to really uh, trick out Otterbean's site. So this is a logo here. It's not a background image. So again, we'd have the, the same thing that happened with Vernon Township if I made that smaller. Um, but here, if we go to their website, we can see that these match pretty, pretty close. Make sure I close the right one. And all of this is going to be controlled again in their theme. They can go in and add those images. Uh, the background, I just provided a link actually in the theme that links to the exact same image that their website is linked to. So there are a lot of different ways you can play around with that. You can also add even more things than there are settings for by going to, well, I did have that at a weird link, so we'll get back to it. Uh, there is a CSS code library included at the um, in the help Aspen Discovery website that that can actually be added as well. And I'm going to show you where that is added down here. Keep on scrolling and it says additional CSS. And you can see that uh, there is some additional CSS that was gathered from that code library that is um, included in here. It's just a matter of copying, pasting it in here, saving, and then uh, it changes the appearance. And what that is doing in this case is it's affecting, um, now this has curved edges on these buttons um, and some cell padding and things like that. Okay. The next thing, and I want to thank Anita Brown, who is in this um, training right now and has been a very engaged member of the training cohort for really putting browse categories through their paces and asking 
a lot of great questions. This is going to be a way for you to highlight uh, your collections. And so we looked at those very briefly. I'm going to go back into the administration. Again, this is going to be a matter. There are two things here. One is browse category groups, and each of your libraries has a browse category group. Those are going to be the browse categories that show up on the homepage of your Aspen website. So if I want to see, and I'm going to use Kendallville as a, an example, I'm going to click on Kendallville. You can see I have some options here. Um, show covers only, show as a grid, which that's something that a patron can also change that view. But now here we see those things that are viewing on Kendallville's homepage. And I'm going to go to Kendallville so that you can see those, what they look like in real life. So these have the same titles as some others that you see throughout. Uh, but they are a little bit different. I can, I know that because it says Kendallville at the beginning of these. And so I can look at this. I'm going to click on edit and Anita is going to hold me to account to not save any actual changes here. And it's going to provide some more information. It's also going to give the opportunity to make even these browse categories a little bit more customized. So you can, of course, add a description for them if you'd like to. And this is kind of what you see is what you get, a rich text editor. Um, you can have a browse category planned out for the future and then have it disappear automatically. So you can have a start and end date here. And you can have subcategories within that. And this is what a subcategory is going to look like. I'm going to click on this new kit items and these are going to be these subcategories. And this is going to give some information about that. I'm going to go into uh, this new adult things. And this is going to give you more opportunity here. But then this is going to um, show what is included in that browse category. The way that browse categories are created is actually through searching the catalog um, while you are logged in as an administrator. And so this defines all those filters that were used to create that browse category here so that if I go to adult items and I see new adult things, that search is what allowed that to be created. So I'm going to get right out of there real quick before I accidentally click on something that I should not. So that is us in the browse categories. And I got to that through the browse category groups. I can also go directly into browse categories without going to the browse category groups. Uh, one thing to keep in mind here is that, oh, I had it back there. Please only edit those browse categories that include your name and the parenthetical name, include your library and the parenthetical name. And so it's not parenthetical right here. It's the text ID. Um, but if it, your name, your library's name is not here at the beginning, please don't edit it. It means some other library did it and they probably don't want you to change it. Um, one of the things you can do, however, is you can go in, you can copy those filters uh, and you can create your own and then edit it if you want it to be similar, but not quite. You can include other libraries, browse categories on your homepage, just again, Please don't edit them. Any questions about browse categories? I'm going to get it in here and I'm going to create one real quickly so that you can see that. There are also a lot of um, interesting ways to manipulate searches within Aspen that um, 
are, I, I don't think that they're as intuitive in Evergreen, but this is just more powerful anyway in terms of creating things. So I'm going to go to new adult audiobooks, and I'm going to click then on this search results um, breadcrumb. And it's going to bring me to a list of results. So I have all of this, but I, I want to dial this in a little bit more. Um, this is not going to be as meaningful for my library as it would be for yours. But from here, I'm going to click on the local library. And then I think I also would like to have this just be fiction. So I'm going to say uh, new adult fiction. It's going to update my search. And then I have the option from the search tools to add to browse. I can either add this to an existing browse category or I can create a new one. Now I'm going to not do this because it would affect everybody because this is an evergreen Indiana one. So you can see again, we have EGIN prod. That's something that is available to everybody, but should only be edited at the administrative level. I have Kendallville. Do I want to add this as a subcategory to Kendallville's Library of Things Lego kits? No, I do not. Um, I would probably want to uh, either, if I'm adding it as a subcategory, find something that was for my own library, and in which case would be the consortial collection. Um, or I could also create this as a new category name, and I'm going to do that. This is just a test. And I'm going to call it as test category. Uh, and sure, I'll add it to the home page after creation. And that's going to be only for things that are not part of a subcategory. So now I'm going to go back here. And um, I don't actually know what, oh, there it is, test category. And so that is now only fiction audiobooks. Now I'm going to go in and delete that. Uh, but, and I also want to do a check here. You can see that that did not show up on anybody else's website, only on the general, because I made it at the consortial level and uh, did not apply that to everybody. In the same way, the consortial collection level, which functions just like a library system. Okay, placards. Placards are another way for you to highlight things about your library. They could be used for collections. Um, you could actually highlight a browse category using a placard. Uh, but it is more likely that your library is going to use this to um, highlight services, uh, resources, and things like that. So um, I'm going to give you an example as soon as I, oh yeah, I'll just sign in here. So I'm going to go again to Aspen Administration, and from here, I'm just going to start typing placards, and I'm going to go in here, and you can see that there is a list. Um, this, there is a problem with this list, uh, and the problem is that it does not um, show who this placard belongs to. Um, it really belongs to everybody until you get into it. So one of the things that we will have documented, but I am saying to you right now, is that when you create a placard, please put the short code for your library at the beginning. And you can see that we have, and it doesn't necessarily have to have a hyphen, but it can um, have those in here. So in this case, we have some uh, for West Lafayette. They have a couple pl placards that they've created. They have an Eclipse program that is coming up. 
And so if I were at their catalog and I put in Eclipse, you can see that this essentially a billboard shows up that is highlighting this uh, program that they are doing on April the 6th. In the same way, take a look back here, um, Kendallville, and I'm going to go ahead and go back to Kendallville. And I'm going to just put in yard games. I'm not sure actually what the keywords are for this because you'll put in keywords that cause these things to appear. Um, but I got lucky on that. Has created this placard that allows them to let people know that they need to make a reservation uh, to check out their yard games. And so it also then includes a link to go to their museum key site. And that's a, a great way to connect um, different bits of information about the library to include this. So the other thing, and I added this for Adams County this morning, um, if I go to Adams County, and this is something also, I know that there are other libraries that use Gale courses. Um, you could either create one separately or also add additional libraries to this one. But if I put in computer application, because I know that that's one of the keywords for this placard, do a search. Oh, and I've already been there today. Uh, let me see if... So I have, and that is that is an idiosyncrasy of the placards that if you've already put in that search and it's appeared, it's not going to show again um, at during the same browser session or for that, that patron. I'm not sure if there's a timeout, but I have other keywords. So you can see now that uh, Adams County, they do provide Gale courses to their patrons. And so we've created a placard here. If they click on this, it's going to open and allow them to access Gale courses from there. There are other places that they will likely want to add uh, that resource, including through their resources page, which we'll talk about in just a second. But this is a way to highlight all sorts of things in your library. Um, one of the things that I will remind you is to honor the image constraints and it does show you what those are, which is a nice thing again about Aspen. If you don't honor them, it gets a little bit wonky. I noticed that the Inspire logo is way too big. So um, I'm gonna actually go in and edit. That was something we did at the inception. I'm going to go in here and you can see that I, and I just got this um, image straight off of the marketing site for Gale Courses, added a little bit of text there, and, um, and that was it. And so then these are the trigger words that are going to allow that to pop up in the search results for that specific placard. And then when you're creating that, make sure that you select your library um, for it to display. I don't, I'm not sure that you actually have to select the locations, but I do it just as a matter of course. Um, okay. And then you can decide if they're dismissible or not, uh, and that's dismissible by the patron. The other a thing that I do want to point out to you this morning, we're not going to get too far into it because this is a bit of a bucket in terms of you can do so many things with it, with this and then the, the next thing and then we will be done this morning, is the resources list. So we did start out all of the libraries, let me pop back here, um, with a basic list of resources here, a link to Inspire, as well as information about the Evergreen Indiana app, but then their um, resources list. This is analogous to the e-resources page for um, the current or the traditional 
uh, search. I guess this is current as well. But this is completely editable. So if I am in here uh, at Adams County, and every library has their own, so you can add whatever you want for your library. And then I go into resources. And then I can um, start adding things in here. Now, also keep in mind, you see that you see all of the resources that are available to all of the libraries. Decide how um, you want to do this. So I see South Whitley's, and I'm going to just click on that. And of course, I'm at Adams County. I go down here, and South Whitley is selected because that's a library that's eligible to use that. Um, Adams County is not. Let's say that this was a resource that both had access to. You wouldn't have to necessarily recreate it, uh, which is why we didn't say, hey, you need to go put in your own things for Gale, Gale legal forms or things like that. We just have all of them selected. But you could, if you saw something there that was meaningful to your library, just add your library to it and it would show up on your web, web resources page. Um, yes, so all of that, and you can see different things that are added there. And if I go to South Whitley and I go to their e-resources and databases, you can see then that their obituary database shows up. Okay, Mindy asks, placards, do I understand this correctly? A patron uses a single search term and stumbles onto a placard. They browse around and manage to maneuver away from the placard. Then they want to go back to the placard and use the same search term to find it once in. Only this time, because they, that's correct. Um, they don't have to use, though, a single search term. Um, and if they are not logged in, it doesn't behave in that same manner. Um, I believe, too, that um, it shows up um, in different browsers, different way. Is there a preview mode before publishing to see if you have it set up the way that you want? Um, Anita is correct. They don't have to be dismissible. And I did set up the, the one in Gale courses as dismissible, but most of the time I'm thinking that a lot of libraries are not having them as dismissible. Is there a preview mode before publishing to see if you have it set up the way you want it? Debbie, that is one of the greatest downfalls of Aspen is that there are no preview modes. So it's basically the Wild West and, and a little bit hopeful. Um, in terms of, and and I will say too, there has been so much back and forth in terms of check this button color, check this. And so uh, I'm gonna make a point at the end very soon that has to do with that. Um, yeah. So I also have, oh, let me go back here. Talked about the resources list. And this is about making those resources more discoverable. Uh, you also have the option uh, to actually build out an entire library website using the web builder. Let me log in again here real quick and show you. So if I go to web builder, which is where the web resources is located, I have all of these options here. to create basic pages, to create polls, forms, to upload PDFs, all sorts of things. And so definitely not going to go into all of that today. There is an entire course that has already been done. I think it's multiple episodes uh, that has been recorded. Um, and this link is a good link, even though I didn't make it linkable, uh, to Aspen Academy, which has some additional information about building out an entire website using this. Um, and we have had questions about that from several um, librarians. Okay, 
That was a lot and not enough at all the same time. So some of you have done all of these things or some of these things. And so if you've already done it, don't worry about it. If you haven't done it, understandable, um, do it in your time. The first thing that needs to happen in a library is that they need to identify their who's going to be administrate a local aspen administrator or ers it can be more than one person there are many things within aspen that have to do with um, just settings or collection highlights or program highlights you can have more than one um, stephanie you make a wonderful point here and i will get there um, as well. Uh, so in terms of identify those administrators, they do not have to be um, IT people at all, uh, but they may be. It doesn't have to be a web designer, but they may be. Um, are current admins able to add a new admin for their library? Not yet, Rachel, but we're going to talk about that uh, in the coming month about opening up the ability for librarians to um, add their own users rather than emailing us. We just want to make sure that there's enough training prior to that. Um, and then there are uh, recorded sessions, again, covering more about administration and about the catalog experience. There are slides. There's more training about the placards and the browse categories. There is an open house that is coming up on April the 10th, and that's going to be with Lena Hernandez, who has led um, a lot of the training for our cohort um, and the creation of training supplies. There is some more documentation that I just don't have linked here yet, as well as there's customizable marketing materials for um, your library. Let me go back to Stephanie's question here real quickly. It seems to need a web design mindset and a bit of coding understanding. Um, neither of those skills I have, and a lot of librarians don't. Is there a way to not turn this on for a library? As a director without a tech person, I have no way of having the time to learn the software. software. Stephanie, it, I will say it is already on and it is already in a functional mechanism for your library. You don't actually have to do anything additional to it at all. Um, if there is an issue in terms of like updating the hours or things like that, um, that you find is beyond you, let us know and we can get those updated again those, even not having those set is not the end of the world at all. It already works. It is already yours. It doesn't have to have anything else done to it. It's only if you want it to. You also don't have to link it on your website at all. Um, so, which that's really going to be how patrons really find it as a, as well as through the, the members list if they're looking on the Evergreen Indiana website. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like a work in progress. So that brings me to this last point here, the local launches. You get to decide when you launch this to your patrons. It exists but you don't have to tell anybody about it until you're ready. We are going to be adding to it a little bit at a time. My guess is that we will be customizing it as we see fit for our library. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, too, this is always going to be a work in progress because your library is always working toward progress. And so browse categories are going to change. You, maybe you want to highlight something here. Maybe you want to not use placards at all right now. Maybe you don't want to add anything to the resources other than what is just available through Evergreen Indiana. Okay, that's fine. That's Or maybe you want to use it to build out an entire website and you have a launch date of 
June 1st, 2025. Okay, that's fine too. And you get to decide how you're going to publicize that, how visible you're going to make it, any number of things. The timeline is really up to you. Those are very good questions. Any more? How do we get started? Those next steps. Make sure that you have an Aspen administrator that is identified. Make sure that they verify their login. Check out some of those trainings. These trainings, um, you'll as soon as somebody verifies, well, not as soon as, as soon as I get the moment to do, as soon as somebody verifies that they log in, I send the next steps to them. And then it just kind of builds from there. There is no pressure for you to do anything you don't want to do or don't have the time to do or whatever that is. And if you feel like there needs to be some even more basic conversations about little things, this is very broad and I understand that. This is, this is high level and a lot of detail. Um, but if you want to get into a little bit of detail about one little thing, that is perfectly fine. Let me know. I know that there is going to be more um, similar to the idea of a round table, just time to get together and have libraries talk about what they're doing, ask questions of one another. Um, people in here, we haven't scheduled that yet, but I anticipate that it's going to be hopefully a monthly thing um, because this is a very big project. But again, it is only as important in your library as you want it to be. Is there a new app to download for the phone? No. Uh, the Evergreen app does not go to the new website. The Evergreen app um, is its own OPAC interface and that is not changing. There may be a decision in the future to go with the Lita app, um, but I will not be in the consortium at that point to help make that choice. And it is a completely separate project on its own. So we will still have the Evergreen app. It will still function as it does. Um, and Anita does make a, a really good point um, outside of that, that uh, one of the nice features of the browse categories is they do stay current without continual monitoring. If any of you have used carousels, um, they require a fair amount of um, monitoring unless they're very basic. And get me started about the cover art is way better in Aspen. Um, I, there's a question in there, Kathy, too, that I need to think about. The Evergreen app lead to the new website. I need to do a little bit of research because you're actually making me think of something else. So thank you for that. There's an I don't know in there. But the search mechanism is still going to be the same in the app. I'm confused on setting up the browse categories, but I'm going to play a little bit and then email you. That is exactly the advice that I have for all of you is to play around with the browse categories. Um, and then when we're talking about local launches, don't pick something that is like next week unless you feel very confident with it being next week. Um, same with Wowbrary, will it lead to the discovery layer? Um, no, it will not lead to the discovery layer right now. Katie, that's a great question. I'll follow up with Jeff on that. have that written. I have to run. Great. I encourage all of you to play around. Um, give yourself before you th even think about launching to play around. Uh, and 
you'll notice on several of the websites, and let me show you Westfields as well. Westfield is moving to a new location as well. So not only is their site under construction, but their um, library is under construction. And so they have, um, they had a date on here. Oh, they still do. Okay. Till June 1st. Um, there's no reason that yours has to be June 1st or August 1st or whatever. It gets to be whatever you want. But they did put this little system message up here. Uh, and I just encourage you to have fun if you want to. This might not be something you care about, but also maybe there's somebody on your staff that does. And, and this might be... Um, something for them to utilize as well. But the conversation will continue. I appreciate all of your questions. Um, I would encourage you to, even if you don't feel like you know anything at this point, if you're still completely overwhelmed, come to the open house on uh, Wednesday, if you're available, it's at 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, noon Central, and uh, Lena will be there from Equinox, and we will just continue working to make this um, the best that it can be for as many people as we can. Y'all have a great day. Thank you for being here. Feel free to um, send me any questions that you have um, and go forth and ask. And <laughs>